needed. Today I'd like to talk about the geometry of yeah. potentials in general, but mostly the two uh, potentials that have the highest symmetry, namely the uh, harmonic oscillator and then the Coulomb field. And we'll put the two of them together in a model that I call the sophomore physics Earth in which you imagine a perfectly spherical and uniform density a sphere called the Earth and the uh, Coulomb field outside of it. And then that meets another field inside that's a harmonic oscillator parabolic potential. And in order to discuss the geometry of that, I want to do a couple of little uh, geometrical tricks very quickly. This the, the sort of an extension of the zigzag method that we talked about in the very uh, complicated freeway collisions at the end of, of the last lecture. Uh, this is a much simpler thing, but it gives you some feeling for um, you know, geometry in general, but in particular geometry of things that have this um, marvelous symmetry that makes it possible for us to solve um, analytically uh, for orbits, and that's all stuff that we're going to do later uh, a little bit in the very next lecture, and then uh, when we get to um, Unit 5, of course, uh, there's the where we get into the uh, details of uh, <coughs> astronomical calculations and things like that. In any case, uh, as I say, outside and inside um, meet somewhere, and that, has, that geometry uh, has to happen. And uh, the other thing I want to do is not just the geometry, but I would really like um, you to get a feeling for the uh, magnitudes of things, particularly the magnitude of the Coulomb field compared to the magnitude that's an electrostatic field, and, uh, to that of the gravity. And um, I'd like to get sort of little uh, models of how, how big things are. Um, if the Earth were crushed to the density of a neutron star or to uh, a, a really ridiculous uh, crushing uh, to the density that uh, we uh, uh, believe black holes uh, have. Um, we'll get that at the very end here um, as we um, discuss, as I say, magnitudes of things. So, um, the for a thing that we'll be encountering then is some monsters. The monsters uh, that we um, actually work with quite a bit in this department, quite a few people uh, looking at the uh, galaxies that have black holes at their center. It was a long time before people realized that that, that was true. But also um, neutron stars are starting to uh, make their appearance in uh, both visible and gravity radiation. So it's worthwhile uh, talking about some of the numbers, just basic elementary uh, stuff uh, uh, with respect to them. And um, I have a thing called the neutron starlet that I'm going to make uh, problems out of. This is very special problems, but imagine that you had some little piece of nuclear matter that was orbiting inside the Earth. It's so dense that the Earth is just cotton candy compared to it but it would feel the gravitational field and therefore it would perform an orbit and that's what we uh, like to see, isotropic harmonic oscillator orbits. What's the uh, basic mechanics and physics of those? Looks as they're important. All of our experimental efforts in spectroscopy now, uh, practically, uh, seem to involve uh, elliptically polarized light, so that's a connection to the mechanics of the ellipse that will be talking about in uh, harmonic oscillators. So um, among the monsters, the, the monster that was uh, hitting us at, when this was done last year was a hurricane called Irma, which never uh, came too much uh, close to the uh, uh, continent, our continent. But this one uh, looks different. This, uh, this monster is already up to, uh, it's talking about uh, category four now and uh, showing up there uh, late Tuesday or early Wednesday. So uh, the physics of <laughs> these things, um, even the simplest physics, which we'll be talking about in a couple of lectures from now, uh, is very interesting. In any case, um, 
I keep adding to this some th things that are of tangential interest, uh, uh, optical trapping and uh, some weird things involving uh, uh, putting uh, C60 molecules through gratings and actually seeing them quantum interfere with themselves. That happened quite a bit time, time be, uh, ago, but now we're really uh, looking at it in some detail. In any case, uh, on all of these um, things, it starts with something very simple, just a straight line equation, and I'm going to make a geometrical power series um, out of this graph. And um, I will go ahead and try to keep these uh, more or less uh, synchronized. And um, the uh, idea of uh, proportionality and um, the use of, of geometry to um, basically build parabolas and other uh, objects out of uh, combinations of lines. Let me see if I've got this thing on to uh, go ahead and get this one ahead there as well. Okay, uh, what we've um, imagining here is uh, just that I've got line y equals slope times x and I've got a slope of 1.5 here and um, I've got my usual 45 degree line y equal x that is so important for the very first lecture um, and I'm asking uh, well okay so I've got that uh, thing I take the uh, slope value of 1.5 and read it off and uh, bingo uh, right away I locate um, y equal sx with x equal to s as S squared, you see. So we've performed a multiplication. We got a, a square uh, just by doing the little zigzag. Okay, and the uh, idea of uh, of this is to uh, keep that zigzag going. Uh, well, I say the next step is uh, be aware that this is a geometry that really wasn't available uh, to Newton, at least not unless he could make some graph paper. But be aware, it's hard to make graph paper, right? Starting with nothing, right? Uh, he didn't have graph paper, okay? And as I, I've mentioned, I think already, that's a piece of technology that we now just take for granted. So we're kind of going back and doing geometry over by having that little tool. And uh, let's just see how it, how it works as, as much as we can here. So, um, let me see if I'm uh, up to date here. In any case, um, this uh, zigzagging keeps up. Get S uh, cubed parallel easily here. And uh, so forth. Even up to S to the fourth. Then we're off the graph paper. Um, that is uh, where this thing uh, would sort of end here if we were trying to just go to larger numbers. But be aware, of course, that you can go and do this backwards, zigzag this way, and now you get things to the negative power. Okay? And, well, you remember the monster mash, right? Uh, it gets pretty kinky down here, right? Infinitely kinky if you are imagining this thing as perfect lines and uh, all of that. So. Um, that uh, is uh, a geometrical series. Now, um, and I'll go ahead and uh, put this one uh, ahead uh, as well. Okay, now, um, ge geometric sequences actually say where the sum of that is a geometrical series. Okay, so that is in, in, in along either axis we uh, made a series uh, that's quite extensive. Now we do something else, which is uh, shown in that slide down there, and I'll bring this one up to date here as well. There's the uh, sequences. And if I simply put a mark on the staircase at the points that uh, have, well, uh, one power, two powers, three powers, and that's uh, 
I'll do it here where I can point at it more easily. I have a curve here that is an approximation to a power law, y equal particularly uh, here s, s is 1.5, 1.5 to the x power. Okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, just a, you know, a zigzag way to get a exponential uh, function. Can I ask a question? Yes. How does that zigzag work? Well, like, why does it work? Just, just the idea that I have a line y equal s x, right? Yeah. And the very first won't hurt us to go back uh, to the where we f didn't have all of them. Basic idea is I made a line here with a slope of 1.5, mm -hmm. and then I zig uh, from uh, one, okay, to uh, here, that's 1.5, okay. okay, and then I say y equal 1.5 times 1.5, that's okay. the product, and each stig puts another power on it, right? Okay. Is that a good question, I wonder how many people but, are but, figuring, what, what are we but, doing here? So the zigs or the zags or whatever get farther apart, don't they? Well, you can see they're getting... Right, so what is, so it just so happens that it's always... 3.75 over? 3.375 over? This one is, but the next one... Would be whatever that is. Whatever that is, the fourth power. Okay. Of the number we've picked, the magic number we've picked, is whatever slope I picked. Okay. Is that, is that clear? Um, I mean, this is not something I found in any book anywhere. I just thought of it one day and figured it... Would. Now we can use it for other things. We're going to make uh, the... Uh, inverse square and the square uh, potentials with zigzags, okay? But this, this one is kind of neat because once you have it, and I'll make sure there's no, no other questions about this, once you have it, uh, you can go ahead and you can make it finer. Uh, we, we're, we're pretty coarse right here. These lines are one unit ahead. I could easily build it. Uh, uh, scale down and get more dots in between their uh, arbitrary limits. Uh, but there I am with the exponential. And while you're at it, remember, you flip x and y, you get a logarithm. Logarithm bait s, <laughs> right? Logarithm bait 1.5. So uh, that's, you know, something worth knowing. So just to remind you, this is something that's in the preface. Uh, we have these levels of geometrical tools, and I should remind you that the Euclidean level, if you're really talking about Euclidean geometry, you're not allowed to have any indications. You're not allowed to have graph paper. You're not allowed to have anything marked. on the, It's just a rule, not a ruler, and a compass. And then you're asked uh, to make, uh, according to Euclid's rules, uh, you know, various uh, polygons and uh, can you trisect an angle? Well, no, you can't. Uh, not exactly, anyway. Uh, but there are lots of other things you can do that are really uh, quite quite remarkable. And so that um, people don't realize that Euclid's Elements, as a textbook, sold more copies than the Bible. <laughs> and the Bible sells a lot of copies, right, over the, those centuries. And so the, the, this is, is a very big piece of our culture, uh, the Western culture. Now, meanwhile, the uh, Middle Eastern culture, the Arab uh, Middle East, they were developing algebra. And algebra has the geometry in it, sort of, and the geometry has algebra in it. And what we're really talking about here is analytical geometry, where you put the algebra and geometry together. And that's the beginning of calculus, which is pretty much a Western uh, invention, Newton and Leibniz and the rest of those guys. So anyway, but then it comes time to actually use the stuff and then you use things like parallel rules. I've got a couple of these here uh, since we're not going to make a big deal out of most of our constructions, you don't really do that. But be aware that then you start uh, talking, well, about graph paper and that's what we're using here in a big, big way. And finally, we just a, not too long ago, we had calculators, right? run things out to 13 figures just uh, well, on my watch here is a better computer than we had at Los Alamos for our scientific work. Anyway, 
uh, all of these simulations and things are part of our toolbox as well. So uh, all of these things that help us uh, do physics, do theoretical physics, but also real physics in the laboratory are pretty important. Now, um, the calculator will give me numbers to, well, this one would go to 12 figures. And here, we, here we're seeing, it, getting the exponential, 2.71828.1828. And it looks like that, that, uh, that's a very weird number in the sense that it looks like it's going to be compete, uh, repeating a uh, fraction, therefore rational, but it's not. The next number is not uh, you know, that sequence uh, at all. In any case, using E uh, to build my, uh, uh, my geometric thing a little, goes a little faster. Uh, than the uh, other, but um, I'll put it up, um, put this one back, put this one <coughs> up to that point. Uh, this one's a little brighter so you can see uh, what the calculator is actually saying there. And um, the exponential curve, uh, instead of 1.5, now I'm working with uh, 2.718. Now we're going to spend in unit 10 a good deal of time uh, dealing with the exponential, the complex exponential, and we're sort of going to be getting to it today, but not uh, directly. But the complex exponential that we'll be needing are the ones that, that make little clocks that describe our oscillators. And that's a really powerful geometrical tool I use in all kinds of, uh, of things. In any case, here's the, the exponential curve uh, that um, would be generated with just E. Now, um, here's that zigzag uh, thing drawn again now. And you have to realize one of the things that the uh, Western culture discovered fairly uh, late was the ability to draw things in perspective. And you'll find, uh, um, starting with Caravaggio, the artist Caravaggio, attempted to make paintings that were really realistic. In other words, he was making a painting that we would now call photographic. That is, realistic. And the shading and all kinds of things. You know, the candle flame would you know, illuminate the whole painting in just the right way. Uh, you know, we're talking the 1300s, 1400s, okay? The 1400s of the Renaissance, but Caravaggio came before that. Um, and perspective, uh, you, the uh, the, people, the, the crew in Athens, uh, they, they already recognized that that was something that was worth doing. Here's a thing with a slope factor S equal 2 that really goes fast. Uh, here's one with 1 half, okay, and um, I'm taking these things not just up here, but I'm also zigzagging uh, down here and then finishing them uh, with various lines. So this this uh, is a perspective view of a hallway, right? And that's another one, and I like to joke about this and say, this is the first day of school perspective of a first grader. You're little, and here's this big hallway, right? But then as a high school student, you come in, you're oh, maybe over six feet tall, and the hall's kind of small, right? And it's just a matter of the scale factor for the perspective. And we're going to see this perspective business show up in the diagrams of phase space of oscillators of various kinds, but even harmonic oscillators are going to have interesting um, ramifications for this business of scaling. And um, that's uh, why I wanted to get that out of the way uh, just right, uh, right here. So let's go back to the simple uh, uh, scaling that's associated with uh, zigzagging to make a just plain parabola. And uh, then look at the geometry of parabola the normal way that you would uh, uh, see. That's the way that the, um, the Euclid uh, people uh, dealt with it. Um, here the zigzag is a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, this is just a, a couple of steps to make one point on a, par a parabola uh, y equal x squared. So basically what you do is you pick some a vertical line, and obviously graph paper helps you do that, 
and then you just go back to the unit line, okay, and once you've uh, got that point, uh, you simply draw a line from there through that point to a point that is on a parabola. That's basically your zigzag line is in using this question mark uh, point, and it's giving you question mark squared, kind of like we got 1.5 squared on that se second step. So this is just showing it in its um, job where now uh, we'll pick other values uh, for that and fill out uh, the parabolic curve. And th that's what we're uh, going to be doing here. So um, let's put this on the other screens here. Uh, blown up, okay, there's the first step uh, right there, and um, there, okay, and then the next step, of course, is to zig, zig back to the, the unit, back to the unit, whatever we call one, all right, and then draw a line through that, okay, and uh, wherever it hits the original line that we started with right here, and this would be 2 squared, minus 2 squared is 4, we've just picked out the point 4, uh, a, a square, okay, and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, this is the way uh, you can generate uh, the problem, and it's going to work below 1 as well. It's just a little trick, you have to zig backwards, okay, that's uh, no big deal, okay, and find the line that goes through that point, okay, and there's your... Uh, other parabolic point uh, down there. And I'll go ahead on this screen as well. Okay, so we picked up a couple of points, one up here and one down here on the parabola, and it's pretty obvious what you do uh, to make as many points as you want uh, by this silly zigzag. And we're not even really using graph paper here, except that, uh, if we want, we want to know what numbers go with those points, uh, we would need that. In any case, this is a picture of the oscillator potential that I might draw whether I do zigzags or not. And the force, in this case a hook law, in this case a potential, uh, their uh, graphs, uh, Hooke's law being just a straight line, uh, the force as a function of the abscissa x, and here the potential as a function of the uh, abscissa x. Now, I've got a 2x line here, which is minus 2x, and I've got an x squared here, just the coefficient of 1. But the basic idea is I pick, uh, we've picked a unit before when we showed uh, the force uh, uh, value uh, uh, increasing and decreasing as we went up and down uh, the various potentials we had in the last lecture, I picked a unit right here, whatever you want, I'm just picking a half here, makes it a little smaller, but it's still giving the right proportion to be normal uh, to the slope vector to satisfy the, the, the physicist definition of a force. That is, the force is equal to uh, minus the uh, derivative, but we're doing sort of differences here. Uh, geometrically and using uh, uh, large values of delta x and delta u uh, at each point. So uh, this one just showing uh, that the force vector for a parabola, if you scale it right, is just the abscissa uh, scaled by uh, uh, minus 2 and uh, so forth. Uh, on either side here uh, is the uh, picture. Okay, so that, that's the end for now of the zigzag approach to this particular thing of force versus potential uh, and the graphing of it. Uh, the next uh, stage here, uh, let me put uh, this stuff up there. I'll just, the next one is a more conventional way uh, to look uh, at the parabola. And um, put these two together and you've got some a pretty powerful geometry to do things uh, with. Uh, these uh, curves, uh, which we'll be doing uh, as we discuss the Earth uh, potential inside sophomore physics Earth. Okay, so let's uh, get
get that uh, in position here and uh, um, give some names. Now we, we will be using uh, conic section analysis in Unit 5 in, in much more detail. There are all kinds of very strange things that really go with the group um, theoretical um, manifestation of the symmetry of a um, Coulomb field and of the oscillator field. And um, that is uh, something that that we should probably wait on. I'm just going to give the most elementary review here of the thing uh, that uh, we need for just discussing uh, our, the parabolic uh, uh, potential. And uh, make sure that you are aware of the most famous use, and those of you who are astronomers, uh, really, uh, especially radio astronomers that use a parabolic dish, but also, uh, well, anybody in the laboratory that's trying to focus uh, laser light at one point, uh, very often it's good to have a parabola because the idea is that all of the vertical uh, rays uh, will reflect in just the right way to send the light through the, it's called the focus. So I, I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of ways to look at this uh, particular uh, uh, structure here. Uh, and give the right names to uh, various uh, parts of this. Um, the umbilical point, okay, the bottom of the parabola uh, right there. At twice the distance of the focus there sits another line and a circle tangent uh, to that line. The line is called the directrix. And uh, let's see what else is I, I need to say. The, letter lambda often used to describe uh, that. Uh, let's change this. This is the old name for the lattice rectum. Uh, <laughs> we better be more politically correct here uh, and get rid of that. Uh, lattice radius, please. Okay. You can look at the old books and you <laughs> get. Um, as I say down here, the old term lattice rectum is an explicit copyright of the extreme Roy Gray gyms in Venice Beach, California, so we'll, we'll try not to use it anymore. And anyway, radius is a good thing because if this was a circle, uh, that would be the radius. You know, come around like that, right? But it isn't. It's a parabola. It's a radius. The, the lattice radius is, is the uh, uh, name that we'll uh, be using. Okay, now let me see uh, if there's anything else here that I need to uh, point out. Oh yes, and this is really important. And this is where I make what I call the kite construction. And that is the distance to the directrix, here to here, to the point on a parabola, is the same as the distance to the focus. No matter where you go, I can swing an arc through the focus and it better be tangent to the directrix. That's a little more subtle uh, definition of, uh, of the parabola, okay? But it's a good one, okay? Distance to the directrix, same as the distance to the focus, okay? Well, that makes a, a, a beginning of what I call a kite. If I just draw a line between there and then draw tangents in their intersection, which is the center of that, I'll be on the tangent line of this. That's what we want. That's the geometry that we're going to need for a lot of things when we get to discuss uh, orbits, even the simple things that we're going to be doing here. So that's the uh, picture to really look at uh, with regard to um, our use of conic sections in general, but in particular ones that involve the, the parabola. Okay, now there's a kite right there. The tangent comes down here, and in the units that we're using, and the units could be uh, this letter uh, P right here, or uh, lambda, which is tw always twice uh, the P, and it is a point exactly opposite to the focus. And the thing that you should remember about a parabola, if you want to find the focus real quick, you just look for that point that has a unit slope. 
In other words, the point opposite the focus, and it will be lattice radius away from uh, the focus, uh, has to have a 45 degree slope. And it makes a square kite. Now as you go out further, in, in particular, if I go from the square kite, uh, which would be uh, right here, to a more like an American kite, I uh, just make a bigger kite as I go up the uh, uh, parabola. But if I s begin to take this point inside that uh, lattice radius, closer uh, to this in the uh, lattice radius, I make a more oriental, I should say Asian or something, uh, a kite. Uh, there's a box kite, but there, that's a very special case. That's uh, more like what you get when you're inside. It's kind of a little rhombus, uh, a rhomboid kite. Okay? Well, there's a couple of points uh, to notice here. Also notice that the circle of curvature is that circle right there, and its radius is also the lattice radius. That's kind of neat. And then there's, of course, the circle to the uh, umbilical point, which is it, just plain old half of the lattice radius. Well, th these are all things that uh, let you describe the parabola a number of different ways, both algebraically and geometrically. Okay, uh, many questions about, about that. It's uh, things that will come up later. Um, a little bit later today, but mostly uh, in more advanced discussions of uh, orbits uh, in uh, Unit 5, which is quite a bit away. Okay, now let's look at um, the Coulomb uh, potential, just quickly and, ge and geometrically. And we used to, I used to have the class do, um, and it was a much smaller class, the actual geometry for this. But this is a zigzag uh, construction. Uh, that, um, and let's get it on all three screens here, uh, is zigzag construction uh, for um, both the potential, which is a 1 over R, but we're going to use the letter X because everything's going to be in a cross-section uh, cross involving the x-axis right here, that will be the center of the, um, of the uh, potential. Uh, and uh, the unit line, it's a, it's a very simple idea of zigzagging again here uh, to get uh, 1 over x and then you just zigzag one more time and you get 1 over x squared. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, being done uh, as well for x less than 1 or x greater than 1. Okay, then uh, <clears throat> we'll be making points that um, lie on curve that you can see there. And there's another uh, uh, set of points uh, that are green that indicate the uh, force uh, function for uh, a Coulomb field. But basically you follow from the, from the origin uh, through the uh, particular value uh, that you're interested in. Uh, <clears throat> here, uh, we're talking about a particular x, a 0.5, okay, and minus 1. So you come uh, to the unit and you zigzag back. And what you get is that particular point for this value of x minus 1 over x. Well, x is a half, so that's minus 2, okay. And uh, then go ahead and draw a line through that one to the unit, zigzag back, and now I get 1 over x squared. And for the, uh, the uh, Coulomb geometry that we're talking about here, very simple case of the unit coefficient, um, there are the two things that we're interested in, the potential, minus 1 over r, and the force, minus 1 over r squared. And this is just sort of a thing that shows the geometrical proportions uh, for that. So, uh, this is what uh, we make, finally, um, we make uh, a whole bunch of points for the potential, and then each time we make one of those, we do another zigzag, and we make all the points 
uh, for the force. Is that pretty clear what has happened there? Okay. I'm wondering why x equals 1? Why are you using that one? Well, that, <laughs> very good question, and that's because it works. Okay. All <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, and the, Would I, picking 2 give you like 2 yeah. over r? Finally, what you would do, of course, once you've made it with a 1, then you can put any proportion on you want. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So the 1 lets you do the zigzag easily. Okay. And um, we've got a nice 1 square. Then the proportions are all laid out in a single rectangle. Okay. No compass is needed, right? It's just ruler or, or just graph paper. You don't even mm -hmm. need a, really a ruler to, to pull this off. Okay. How did you notice that it was x equals 1? Pardon? How did you know, oh, x equals 1 will work? Well, the 1 is so special. You, I mean, the, 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 I guess that comes from, you know, the group theory. And the unit element of an algebra group is, you know, that's, that's number 1. <laughs> the, main, the main man or main woman in the uh, whole uh, gestalt of the uh, uh, geometry. Now, group theory is just grown-up geometry really like, come down to it. Shouldn't be afraid of it. So, uh, it's these guys. Now, that's what I would have you do, and I would do it on the board with you if we were going to. Um, but we've got more to cover this year than uh, we had. We're in the luxury of time when this uh, sort of thing was happening. So I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of that in the homework uh, next week. Um, but for now, uh, there's the Force curve right there. And, and what this does, you see, you, you put your hands on this thing and you get a feeling for how the Coulomb is really long range as a potential. But the force, you know, it falls off pretty darn fast. So it, you get out to, you know, maybe the end of the board there and you can hardly see uh, the force. But the potential, with you all, all the way to Fort Smith practically. So uh, that, I think, is important. Now we got to do the inside job as well. Okay, because the sophomore physics Earth has the other kind of high symmetry potential, namely the one that has unitary symmetry. This guy's got orthogonal four-dimension symmetry. Those are the two groups that are behind the scenes, making it possible for us to do analytic discussions, making it possible for Newton to get famous. Okay. So let's talk now about the actual physics of these things. And in particular, uh, if we're talking about electrostatics, you've all seen this guy, right? How many people know what numbers to put here and here? Anybody? Nine, nine, nine. Yeah. That is nine. Eight, eight point nine nine ten to the nine, mm -hmm. ten to the positive nine. Yeah. 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 Now. What I would do, and, and this is, you're going to be teacher someday, okay? You throw in that four or five figure thing right away, not going to remember, right? But if you put what it uh, is approximately, and that's what I want to do here, I'll put it on this screen down here first, it's 9E9. That's pretty easy to remember, right? So, uh, Sure, 8.987551, okay, now plus or minus, I will talk a little bit about how well that's known. We're working very hard and pushing these uh, decimals out on this one, just like we did the speed of light. But it's really close, 8.98, okay, you, you round it off to three, it's, this is good, this is pretty good, right? And I'd like to do that with as many constants as I can, simply because, well, I have bad memory. <laughs> and it's getting worse. So, got to do this. So, uh, that, that's the thing that I uh, want you to be uh, aware of. And, and not only that, 99 is a nice number and all that, okay? But, that's huge! Monstrous! 9 billion! That's a big number. I mean, essentially we're talking 10 to the 10th. Okay, huge number. 
and you say, oh, it's because the Coulomb is such a monster. It's not a monster. One ampere, which you get 10 of when you start your car, the old-fashioned kind of cars, uh, uh, it, it's putting through that Coulomb every second if it's one amp, right? And it's more like 30 amps. So put 30 of these suckers through every second. Okay, so the, that, the, that indicates to me that the, the Coulomb is not such a terrible, but it is a terrible number. If I actually assemble a Coulomb of charge in this room, I blow up Fayetteville, right? I mean, it's a monster. Okay, so this is our first monster right here. And you can ask yourself, how much charge is Coulomb? And what kind of units do you have in your finger? How many Coulombs are in there of electronic charge? presumably balanced, or you've got a, a bad finger <laughs> uh, with a positive charge of the nuclei, right? But how many? How much of each of those you see? So what I'm doing here is just reminding you of your freshman chemistry. We've got the Avogadro number for a mole. We've got a, a water molecule. You're mostly water, so we can use water as a good uh, indicator of what uh, is going on inside your, your finger. And uh, a molecular weight here of 18. We got two hydrogens and one oxygen, okay, and uh, one mole. All right, has this many. So I've got to go, and I've got to uh, say that if I have a cubic centimeter, that's one gram of, of, of water. That's one eighteenth of a mole, okay. Uh, I've got one eighteenth of Avogadro's number. This point three times ten to the twenty-three. That's a lot of of particles, admittedly. Okay, and we, we've got roughly that, that's um, <clears throat> electrons and protons in there. If we have 10 electrons and 10 protons, we put a move decimal over a little bit here. So that works out to about 50,000 coulombs. 50,000 coulombs in your fingertip. Fighting with 50,000 minus coulombs to make your finger stable. So you don't blow up your manicurist, okay? So uh, th 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 that gives you some feeling for you know what's going on. Now, here's a case of big versus small. What about gravity, gravitational force? Okay, and we're talking MKS here, so we'd be talking about some number of kilograms and um, uh, in, in, in the. Uh, uh, say the Earth, and then so many kilograms in your body, okay, you got some attraction uh, that involves the radius of the Earth, but anyway, this, this is another one that I put question marks on all the time, okay, do you, do you know what that one would be? And I mean in a way so that you, when you're teaching this, you don't uh, snow them with a whole lot of numbers, but this one doesn't have a whole lot of numbers, because we don't know this one. It was anywhere near the precision of this one. And that should be uh, a, a challenge to you because with all the astrophysics that's going on now, we're getting better ways to handle this one as well. And in any case, um, these uh, numbers are so darn important that we would really like uh, to have ways uh, to, well, first of all, deal with them in an elementary fashion. This one, instead of being 10 to the 10th, works out roughly, very roughly, to 10 to the minus 10th in MKS, okay? It's two-thirds of 10 to the minus 10th. It's pretty good. That's about as far as we, this is, you know, th these uh, numbers in light blue here are sketchy. We really only have this thing to, at best, five figures now, and we're trying for six, so. Uh, you should be aware uh, that uh, there's work to be done in the gravity uh, department. In any case, instead of being nine and nine zeros, this one is a whole bunch of zeros and then two thirds, 0.67. Okay, that's, that's what we're dealing with uh, here as far as the thing that's keeping us on the floor of this room. And uh, we feel this one and deal with this one a lot more than we do directly uh, with this one, but that one's important for us uh, in all of our physics and chemistry. Okay, now, um, 
the real measures of any of these uh, is not just the force, but also the potential, the, the potential thing here. And again, it's the same constant. It's just that now I'm going to be having r to the first power instead of uh, to the second power. Uh, and uh, if it's the Coulombs I'm uh, worried about, then um, I can take this uh, potential here and actually figure out how much work I'm getting out of, uh, or how much of, of a bomb I'm going to be making if I put a whole bunch of these uh, Coulombs together and uh, uh, say a uh, unstable nucleus like uranium. That's, uh, these are all things we can calculate now uh, from this big number uh, here. Now, just to get, get the, uh, the uh, sort of nomenclature down, uh, nuclear size um, is so many, 1, 2, 3, 4, maybe 10, 20, and so on, as you go through the uh, <coughs> periodic chart, or the chart of nuclides. Uh, femtometer, femtom, femtometer, how do you pronounce that? Femtometer is so much uh, what I hear all the time, okay? Meanwhile, atomic size, okay, a hydrogen atom has a diameter of 10 to the minus 10th. That's a, uh, <clears throat> that's 10 angstroms is a, a nanometer. Uh, this is one angstrom that we're talking about for the hydrogen diameter, or 0.5 angstroms uh, of, uh, for the radius uh, of the um, wave function, and of course the wave function has got this funny exponential shape to it, so you have to say, uh, you have to uh, specify if you want exactly uh, where you, you draw the line uh, for that. But uh, this is all uh, just a rough description of these links. So we're comparing here atomic uh, to nuclear. Um, now, FM is a perfectly good uh, shorthand for it. But so is capital FM, because this particular unit is also called the Fermi. It's 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. That's the same as 10 to the minus 15 meters. Uh, so one Fermi, and that's not a picture of him, but uh, I'm just imagining uh, here that we're talking about a nucleus of some other atom beside hydrogen, which only has a proton, but something in the middle of the periodic chart. I've got something with a few say a dozen uh, Fermi's for its diameter or radius, I haven't said uh, which. So uh, you get this, and th this is an amazing piece of classical mechanics that Rutherford did by throwing alpha particles at gold uh, atoms and noticing how they scattered off of them as though there was just a single tiny point at the center of the atom, uh, the atom being uh, hundreds of thousand times bigger in terms of its electronic size than the nucleus. And that was a big surprise. I mean, you can imagine uh, what a ruckus that made, and Rutherford is a very famous uh, name uh, because of that. But now it's time to, you know, get, a, get that into your head and realize how much empty space uh, these atoms and molecules have. And that uh, uh, so much of the matter is packed uh, into the nucleus, absolutely packed, and so when you make a neutron star, you get something that's really dense. So I, I make this point here, that the nuclei radii, and let's get all of this thing uh, going here on the same screen. We keep forgetting to do that, but um, the uh, basic ideas are that if the nuclear radii are 100,000 to maybe a million times smaller than the atomic, that's chemical radii, the molecular radii, uh, th then the nuclear energy that's packed there is 100,000 to a million times larger than what you get if you're doing a chemical, uh, say, explosion, if you're talking about blowing up TNT or uh, some uh, um, nitrogen explosive of some kind, that's Coulomb repulsion and makes a pretty big bang and kills a lot of people. But this one is a million times more. Okay, and, and so you get a feeling there uh, for how much energy you get uh, when uh, 
a, 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 a unstable nucleus splits, and that's nuclear fission energy, which is powering our nuclear power plants, as you know. Now, um, I should uh, probably remind you that when people talk about that energy, they also always say, well, that's E equal mc squared. But good luck using that to figure out how much energy you get, right? You can't measure those masses right accurately enough to get a good reading on it. So th th this is the thing that's giving you that, that number. Okay, that 9E9 is uh, at work there, not MC squared. We'll come back to Mr. C squared a little bit later. Okay, now here's a quick thing that I need to um, make a point about. We're doing things in an elementary fashion, and when it comes to describing the mechanics of a uh, Coulomb force of any kind, electrostatic a force, or else the gravitation, and that's what I'm, I'm aiming at uh, right here, is the uh, gravitational one. And it's the uh, ideal inside of, this, of the uh, sophomore physics Earth. But I start uh, here the way, kind of the way uh, uh, Newton and others uh, did. This is the geometrical approach to Gauss's law. Uh, basically the idea that is that if I were sitting on a planet right now, and it, it's fun to imagine that we had as a planet a great big shell, all the mass is somehow really packed, so it, uh, I've got a, you know, a space, uh, the shell is about this thick, okay? And there's a manhole cover uh, in the middle of this room. I lift up the manhole cover, everything looking nice. Ooh, it looks dark in there. Uh, what I can do is lower myself into that manhole cover, right, up to, you know, say about there. And if it if all works out, this geometry is right, and let go. And I'll just sit there, right? Inside this shell, you have no, you're weightless, right? Now what you don't want to do is push like that because then you're just going to start moving and oh no, I'm flying out into the center of this thing. I'm gone, right? But I could just be floating uh, if the Earth were shell had a manhole coming out. You know, you know, this is all fiction, but it's fun to do this for physics, right? Think about uh, that. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, what th that means then is no matter what shell I use, it's always going to be weightless inside. This is uh, the uh, basic idea.